Hi, my name is Sabina Simons and I'm the Outreach Services and Volunteer Coordinator for the Tolbert County Free Library and you are watching The Library Presents Get Out and Go Eastern Shore Road Trips. Jim Duffy and Jill Chisuka are the founders of Secrets of the Eastern Shore, a local online business that celebrates the heritage and beauty of our area in words, pictures and products. Jim is an award-winning magazine writer whose work has appeared in numerous regional publications. And Jill is a photographer and graphic designer whose work has been featured in solo and group shows in a number of local galleries. Their Eastern Show Road Trip book, which came out late in 2016, is the first in a planned series of Secrets of the Eastern Shore guidebooks. Upon release, it landed at the top spot in several Amazon top seller categories, including Mid-Atlantic travel books and hot new releases in U.S. travel. They have lived in Cambridge since arriving on the Eastern Shore in 2004. Please welcome warmly, Jim and Jill. <laughs> Good evening. Thanks to everybody for coming. This is uh, uh, it's, uh, it's turned out as a lot larger than I expected. Great. We appreciate you all taking the time out of a beautiful evening like this when you could be strolling downtown or eating at a sidewalk cafe or doing the other things you do in life to come and uh, listen to us blab a little bit. Appreciate it. Um, so, how many, let me just ask, how many of you, the show of hands, are familiar with the Secrets of the Eastern Shore Facebook page? Have you seen? Just a few. Okay, that's just, that's just good to know. Okay. So let me, uh, uh, okay, let me um, tell you where I started with this book, okay? Um, I, uh, so I'm a magazine writer by trade, and I was looking to take on a book project. And I did all of my research, all the due diligence that you're supposed to do. And what I learned in doing that research is that people have zero attention spans here in the 21st century. They have time for nothing. Everything has to be short. Everything has to be to the point. You want them to get out of there in 100 pages and be done with it. And that was actually the book that I started to work on. I started to work on a very short book that was more oriented for tourists. Um, probably, and it was very user friendly, and it was just going to be boom, 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 you have it in your back pocket, and just a few short sentences in each place, and go on. And then, this is what happened. Jill and I went to Cape Charles, and I was doing research for that book, I'd never been to Cape Charles, so we drove all the way down there, went to Cape Charles, we're driving into town, and we passed by this crazy abandoned building. And I got a uh, bug up my you know what? I'm like, what is up with that crazy building? Um, and so when I came home, we took pictures of it. When I came home, I got online, and I started looking up what is the story behind this building. And it turns out that it has a very interesting story. Um, it's actually in the book, if people have made it through the book. Um, in the 1920s, when cars were still brand new, they were very popular, but gas stations were not popular at all. People hated having gas stations in the neighborhood. They wanted nothing to do with them. They were all filthy, they were dirty, they were fire hazards. They wanted nothing to do with gas stations. A guy at the Pure Oil Company decided that he was gonna fix that by making the most beautiful gas station in the world, one that everybody would be proud to have as a neighbor. And so he built his gas stations as an uh, English cottage. And there, there was, behind here there's, is, is the garage bay, is behind here, but that's the shop. And they had flowers and they all had the beautiful um, tile roof. Um, and it went over so well, this thing was Carl Peterson, and he was a self-trained architect, and he made it up himself. And pretty soon, uh, his early versions of this were so successful that every pure station all over the country started to look like this, and there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them from one coast to the, to the next. And people look back on it now, and when you hear that modern-day buzzword about corporate branding and doing things to get your image up, they point to this building as an example of where that began. Okay? And so I learned all this story, and it goes against everything I learned about the book I want to do, right? Because the book I want to do has nothing to do with these little details. But I have the Secrets of the Eastern Shore Facebook page, and I kind of play around on there, and I do some things on there. And I have a little website, so I did a thing on the website, and then I threw it up on Facebook. I was just having fun. It had nothing to do with my plan to do a book. People love this little story. It would, I mean, it just went you know, viral, or whatever the proper word is. Um, and it went crazy, and people loved it. 
And so I started to do a few more little things like this, where something would catch my eye and I decide to go down some rabbit hole and spend some time on the internet or spend some time in a place like this at the Maryland Room or, or, or wherever else or talk to some people in the street about what the backstory is and started putting up more and more of these stories. And then I started working on another book altogether. All right, so the first book just went in the trash can. And the second book, um, because people, and most of the people I think, are, I don't know if it's most of them, a lot of the people who are interested in these stories are actually from here. So I started out right thinking about tourists, but I ended up thinking about people who either live here or who are living here but you know uh, came from somewhere else, right? Um, and that's where I kind of uh, went. And that, so I, I think of this building as how this book teaches, right? Because that's where, that's where my whole plan changed, started to change, is with that book. Um, a similar thing happened with my next project. So my next book, the working title of it is called uh, The Tubman Travel Companion, 32 Underground Railroad Journeys on the Dumb Um And Jill and I moved here from Baltimore, moved to Cambridge from Baltimore in 2004. And I, the day after we moved in, boxes all over the house, I got up that morning and I had, we picked up the local paper, you know, journalist, that's what you do. Uh, there was a notice in there that there was a group called the Harriet Tubman Discussion Group was meeting at the Cambridge Library. And so with the boxes full, I walked out of all the boxes and said, I'm going to go see what this Harriet Tubman Discussion Group is about. Um, and that is what sort of started that whole project. This gentleman, John Creighton, is the guy who used to lead that discussion group. He's actually a real important figure in, in how Harriet Tubman kind of came back to prominence over the last sort of 30-ish, uh, 40 years. Um, uh, and so that also, that's, that's kind of how that, just how these book projects take shape by complete accident. You just see something in the paper on the wheel, and off you go, and, and, and there it is. So that's kind of the introduction about where I started. And I thought in talking about trips, I would, rather than to kind of do some whole table of contents thing, we wanted to talk about the different types of experiences we have in doing the, in doing the book trips. Um, and a few of these I'm going to do are kind of local in this area, and then others are a little more far, far from. So the, the first one, I'm, I'm calling rabbit hole, because I really, I really love jumping down these rabbit holes, and kind of learning all these stories and things that are going on. Um, and so the first one is uh, Unionville Road. Everybody know where Unionville Road is? Mm -hmm. Right, everybody got that? Way, way off to St. Michael's from here? Um, I actually do not remember where I sort of got, and it might have been, you know, here in the Maryland Room or wherever. I, I actually don't remember where it was I heard that there were U.S. colored troops buried along the Union Hill Road. I, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. um, but I had a lot of fun figuring out the story of how that came to be. Okay? Um, and that led me to some guy's college dissertation and some, mili some old military guy had helped the government with his connections, put up the marker that's out there behind St. Stephen's Church. Um, so, so anyway, this is, on your way out you need the road, you're out in kind of in the turf of the Lloyd family out there, particularly back uh, in, the, in Civil War times. Um, and I just have a lot of fun kind of putting things in my mind's eye and trying to see them. So if I'm driving down Unionville Road, I'll be thinking about, it used to be called um, Kogel's Town. And Kogel's Town was full of free and slaves, uh, free blacks and slaves. And so along the long end of the road would be all these cabins and chickens and kids and laundries and guys chopping wood. And that's, that's part of what I do um, um, when I go out is try to understand enough about a place or help you understand enough about a place to kind of put that in your mind's eye as, as, as you're going out. So it's called Coville's Town because a guy named Ezekiel Coville moved there in 1856, bought a 300-acre plantation Yes, uh, called Lombardy, which is still there. Um, you would think that a guy like this would be like super rich and super wealthy and everything else. He actually was not. He was a, he was a Quaker. Uh, he was from Delaware. The place, the building the, that he bought, the Lombardy plantation, had just um, burned down. So here is, uh, actually this is a quote from the book that is actually includes a quote from him. They repaired a little section of the house to serve as living quarters. Enough, in Ezekiel's words, quote, so that we could stow ourselves away in it with rather more commodious accommodations than those enjoyed by passengers in a crowded omnibus. So they went here to Third Haven, here in town. Um, and 
they were uh, abolitionists. They, they, they didn't believe in slavery. They hired their workers. They didn't have slaves on their plantation. Um, he called his neighbors the Goliaths, the Nebuchadnezzars, and Pharaohs of the peculiar institution. Can I desire to fraternize with such and partake of their abominations? His son John would claim to have been cast one of the two votes that Abraham Lincoln got while in Talbot County, yeah, in, Talbot County uh, in that first election. Um, so after the Civil War, uh, Ezekiel Kogel, um, <coughs> So, so there's, there's a whole, uh, little bit in the book about the recruiting of uh, black people to join the, the Union Army from Talbot County. And a bunch of those guys come back. And Kogel strikes a deal with them because I will give you some land for a church and school uh, if you guys set up at least 15 houses. So 15 of these veterans um, decided to set up houses. Uh, he donated, they had to pay, uh, you know, rent um, on the land that they got. And they would build their own houses and then um, he would, uh, he donated the land for the church and the school. Um, and that is from the, some, that's one of the U.S. Colored Troop, um, the <coughs> cemetery behind St. Stephen's. And this is a, it's a kind of trip that, that I like to go down and I like to help people. I, I try to make it easy. It's a lot of work to go down one of these rabbit holes. I try to make it easy for, for you guys to go down the rabbit hole by putting it all in one place. Are you having trouble hearing me? A little louder. All right, thank you. Um, <laughs> So that is, that is one. Another local one uh, that's a kind of type of trip is uh, Missing Pieces. And these are things that are, where things have just changed. And what used to be there is not there, but you have to look at it, or something new is there, so you know. Um, and we all know here the Hooper Strait Lighthouse um, in St. Michael. So when I talk about going to the Maritime Museum, you look, I talk about how there's a lot of different layers to it. You can go in there, you can see a pretty lighthouse, you can go out to lunch. You can go in there, you can learn the story of a really interesting lighthouse going back to 1828 or whatever it was. This weekend actually is the 50th anniversary of the opening of that lighthouse in uh, St. Michael's. Um, it was 50, 50 years ago on Saturday, I think it was, that they held the grand opening for that. Um, but there was something else there before, before that which is what I found interesting. So it's kind of a third layer you can go into in a place mm -hmm. like that. Um, and that just um, is the, uh, there was a packing house right on, right on that spot. Coleman and Jewett was the name of the packing house. It was founded in 1903 by a guy who was also a U.S. colored troop. Um, so he's a black guy from Crisfield. Um, just a couple of interesting little tidbits about their operation. Um, until the oysters died out, nobody really ate crabs here uh, very much at all. They didn't like crabs here um, <laughs> for the oysters. But when the oysters ran out, the fishermen and the packing houses needed something to do, so they figured out to go with crabs. And it was at Colburn and Jewett that they came up with the rating system that we use today of back fin, special, regular, claw, and lump. Um, Frederick's son, El Wood, uh, the other interesting thing about Frederick, he used to commute back and forth to Crisfield all the time because he had family in Crisfield. And that, of course, took him right through Humber Strait, which is where that lighthouse was standing whenever he was commuting between St. Michael's and Crisfield. Right? Um, so Frederick's son, Elwood, uh, hard to imagine in a packing house, but he very famously wore a white suit to work every single day. <laughs> he was there. Um, and they were, uh, for a long time, and it's just, I don't know, you know, history's just full of things that are a little bit of a surprise. And looking back, maybe I shouldn't be so surprised. I, I, don't, I don't know how to react to it. But for a long time, that was the largest employer in St. Michael's. It was a black-owned um, packing house um, right on Navy Point there, where the lighthouse um, stands today. Um, so that's kind of the third layer. So that's kind of the uh, things that aren't there. There were, there's another example in the Tubman book that I'm working on. Um, there's a chapter there called View from the Lighthouse, which is the Chop Tank River Lighthouse in Cambridge. That's a replica lighthouse. It's only been there five years. The lighthouse that it was based on was only there 19, anyway, it wasn't there when Tubman was there. But it has these views of the Tubman landscape on all four sides that are really great. And so that's actually chapter one of the Tubman book, even though it wasn't there. So it's just kind of coming up with different ways to look at the landscape and see what used to be there in, in, uh, in a different way. The, 
Third type of trick we have, my favorite, I think, serendipity. Oh, wait. Edgemication. Oh, no, let's do this one first. Edgemication. This, this is another local one before we go down to Virginia for a second. Uh, anybody know Captain Wade Murphy? This was back early 2000s. Still living in Baltimore. We lived here in 2004, so I was still living in Baltimore. I was taking these classes at Johns Hopkins, uh, getting a certificate in kind of an adult ed program, nothing fancy, but a certificate in environmental studies. So I was reading all, everything in like, you know, the Bay Journal and textbooks on, you know, study of the Chesapeake Bay environment and all these expert teachers and I was listening to them all. And uh, I, I thought I knew a little something. I'm also a magazine writer. And a magazine, I think it was Chesapeake Bay Magazine, sent me down to go out. Uh, I don't know if it was a travel story about Tillman Island or if it was just something about Captain Captain Wade, but I went out with him one day, and oh boy, he was on a tear, right? He just, he just started off on this one topic about ghost pots in the bay, and he would not stop about it. Now, I've been doing all this reading for, you know, a couple of years now, and, and it's a topic I've been interested in before that. I had never heard a word about it. Those pots and the fact that there were these crab pots down there and crabs were getting trapped in there, and that's one of the big problems with the crab population. So I was kind of like, ah, what's up with this crazy water? And you know, I hadn't, I hadn't really met one before. He was the first one I ever met. Um, and then this is, uh, so that was sometime 2002, 2003. This is the run of headlines that later appears in the Bay Journal. 2006, they check in and they don't check out. Abandoned ghost crab pots haunt Bay's bottom. 2008, derelict pots raise specter of ghost fishing. Lost traps numbering in the thousands continue to catch crabs. 2010, watermen volunteer to pull 10,500 derelict crab, pay from, uh, crab pots from the Bay and its rivers. 2013, ghost pots estimated to kill 1.25 million blue crabs in Virginia's water. Um, and so, I, you know, I'm not, I don't draw any gigantic conclusion that, oh, the watermen are always right and the environmentalists are always wrong. But I did learn that day a little humility, uh, you know, about thinking that you know something and you got somebody who's been out on the water all the time. And, and my first reaction really was honestly to go, oh, that, oh, what a crazy waterman. I've never heard any of the experts I listen to talk about this. Uh, I learned a little humility. And so, so getting an education like that while you're out there um, is, is uh, one of my favorite kind of uh, trips too. Um, I learned that the, um, well, now let's, let's do the uh, next one, Serendipity. These, this is the one that I said was my favorite. And I think when people ask me what was the favorite trip that we took, that this was probably uh, my favorite trip. We went to uh, Saxis, Virginia. Anybody been to Saxis? Little, tiny, one horse, real deal waterman town on the Pokemon Sound in uh, Virginia. Instead of turning left to Chincoteague, you turn right to Saxis. It's a very different place. So uh, we went down there. It's a little town. And we picked exactly the wrong day to go down. So they have one restaurant. They have one museum. Turned out somebody important in town had died. Everybody was at the funeral. The restaurant was closed. The museum was closed. The streets were empty. We drove all the way down there. We started wandering around. She gets with her camera. There's this interesting old boat here in the yard. She gets out. Um, actually, no, that was the second thing. Let me back up. First thing, we're, we're kind of on our, after that, we, we're kind of wandering around, and we see a sign for some birding trail, and we follow the sign to some birding trail, and we end up uh, this ramshackle little boat launch with a building that looks like it's falling apart and there's an old lady and her dog and somebody else on the front porch out there and uh, you know we were kind of looking for a burning trail and she's like come on in so we went in there this is Peggy Linton and her dog Jake Jake and her dog Jake <laughs> that's me hiding my face back there in the background um, and so they're, you know, doing, a, doing soft shell floats and the whole soft shell operation. I'm probably spent, I don't know, 45 minutes or an hour in there just walking around, talking to her, and petting the dog. And 
I have that in the book, and I'm like, I'm, you know, I don't know, Miss Peggy was in a good mood that day. Don't you expect to get a tour when, you know, every time you go down there? But you know, seeing things like that happen when you just get out and, and wander around. So then, so then we're in Saxis where I'm actually, yeah. So then we're in Saxis where everything is closed, um, and Jill gets out. She starts taking pictures of this boat, um, and uh, guy pulls up in like this 1970s LTD kind of thing. Um, and, I'm, and he gets out of his car, and I'm like, I'm so sorry, sir, we're kind of in your front yard here, aren't we? And uh, next thing I know, he had found somebody to open the museum for us. He had told us the whole history of this crazy bull by boat that's in his front yard. He had taken us into some insurance company where we barged into the president's office so we could see a picture of this old boat in its glory days. <laughs> he had Jimmy Dennis was his name. And then he capped it all off by taking us into uh, two, was it two houses or was it just the one? There was two We houses. only saw the one. We only saw the one, but he has like three of these houses um, that are f like so full you wouldn't even believe it. Like something on the border <laughs> yeah, something on the border show, all of Christmas people. Um, and so he got out there and he flipped the breaker because this was like the middle of summer or something like that. And he flipped the breaker so that all the lights would come on. And he took us inside one of these houses to show us his Christmas display. We had no appointment. We had no nothing. The whole town was in a funeral. He just happened to pull up. So that's obviously, you know, really, like, that's... Well, four that's, hours later. Yeah, exactly. Four <laughs> hours later. Yeah, I had another one of these doing just a few weeks ago doing the uh, Tubman book. I was at the Quaker Friends uh, ha uh, meeting house in Camden, Delaware, where uh, an underground railroad conductor named John Hun, H U N, is buried. And I went in there and I'm looking around for his grave and I find the grave of his son. His son's like, was a governor of Delaware, he was a big deal, but I can't find him. And I finally find him and just as I find him, this couple pulls up another ratty old car, if I recall it correctly, this one's more hatchback than giant LTD. This guy gets out and he's emptying the garbage cans out of me. And he walks over and he's like, how are you? And I explain to him what I'm doing. His name is Mike Richard. He spent a long time working for the Delaware Department of Historical and Cultural Affairs. And actually, he is um, um, he is a guy who pulled John Hahn, the Underground Railroad, doing research with that department. He helped pull John Hahn out of obscurity and establish that he was an Underground Railroad conductor. He also, by sheer accident, happens to be the family uh, descendant of the Kogels, who are on Unionville Road. And he is actually working on the exhibit that's going to open at the Historical Society. I think next week, there's a 150th anniversary of the founding of Unionville, where he's going through all of his family stuff, and he's given it all to the Historical Society, and they're going to do the exhibit there. And it was quite literally, he was, I was there looking for John Hunt's grave, and he was emptying the track. And otherwise, I never would have met him. So anyway, I've gotten a lot of great stuff from, 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 from him. All right. Uh, some stories are just. Uh, Let me go back to, because this is along the same time, back on Saxon Island. I just wanted to show you this one thing from the 1930s in the book. All right? The 1930s in Saxon Island, circus came to town. It was, it was brought to town by a guy who was determined, as people still are today, to make Saxon a tourist destination. They're just determined. And they've been determined for a long, long time, over many, many years, to do this. And this guy was determined, and he brought a circus to town. Um, and here is what happened. During the night before the show was to open, a thunderstorm swept in, blew down the tent, and spooked the elephant, which pulled its chain peg out of the ground and ran northward up the island. Linwood Linton, on his way to work early the next morning, saw it emerge, trumpeting loudly from a marshy pool near Albert Selby's garage, and in his fright ran home so quickly that it is said he ran straight through the unopened screen door. <laughs> Herbert Bailey awoke to discover the animal had done his business right at his front door, and after summoning his family to examine the giant dropping, asked his wife, Ella Blanche, 
What should we move, the pile or the house? <laughs> That fits right in with this one. Some stories are just kind of, they really are too good to be true. And they really are like all over the place here um, in this area. Um, so there's one, I think this is the next one up, is Cecile Steele. So this is Cecile Steele. She lived in Ocean View, Delaware. Her husband worked for the Coast Guard in Bethany Beach. And while he was working, she used to raise some chickens on their little bitty bitty farm. She got 50 chicks a year. Well, some supplier or another, right? The name is in the book. I don't have it here in my notes. In 1923, those hatchers, instead of sending her 50 chicks, sent her 500 chicks. <laughs> she put them in a piano box for a while while getting some neighbor of hers to build a makeshift shed. However many months later it takes to grow a chicken. Uh, she had 387 birds, and she sold them all at 62 cents a pound and made really, really good money. Then she did it again the next year. And she is widely recognized as the person who gave birth to the modern day poultry industry. A few years later, I think this is in the book too, a few years later, her husband started to claim it was his business. It was, she, she actually started it. The same thing happened when I did Ocean City on the boardwalk. Um, I just wanted, I was trying in the book, I was trying to kind of limit Ocean City. It was too big a topic. If I did it the way all the other chapters were done, I'd barely touch on anything because I had too much to do. So I kind of decided to limit myself in the boardwalk. And yeah, I have all these historical tidbits and everything else where I'm going. So I decided to look into the uh, uh, history of the boardwalk on Ocean City. This is Ella Dennis. She arrived in Ocean City. So you know, she arrived in Ocean City weighing 88 pounds and she was really sick. And she kind of came there on doctor's orders. She soon, uh, for the weather and the salt air and everything else, she soon put on 40 pounds and ended up um, opening a hotel. And this happened uh, with women over and over and over again. There's five of them that I listed in the book, and the Ocean City, Ocean City Life Saving Museum has about nine of them that are in there, all from the first part of the uh, 20th century. One of them has a local connection, Rosalie Tillman Shreve. Um, had, uh, there was a, a plantation near Oxford where there were a lot of slaves um, that she inherited, but things did not go well after the Civil War for her family. So she was flat broke, had two kids, was 19 years old, uh, moved to Ocean City, and she's the one who built the original really, really beautiful, if you've ever seen a picture, I should have it in here, the Plimp Hinnon Hotel with all of the, the things. So she's the one who built that. Um, there's like five, so, and they're all like, there's, there's a deaf woman who left Virginia's a deadbeat husband in Virginia, and then there's some other woman who got so sick of her family coming down to visit, and she put room rates up on the wall, and they all ended up, they all ended up becoming like these, these hotel magnets in Ocean City, and, and Ella Dennis's uh, quote, the, the most famous quote of this petticoat regime, as it's called in the history books, Ocean City is 70% run by women, built by women, and the men are all hen <laughs> um, so I'm always on the lookout for things like that. Especially, you know, when I'm playing around on this Facebook page and doing things on my website, people just, people really, a lot of people really love these little, these little stories. And that's kind of the direction that, that the book went, is every time <coughs> something kind of crazy happened or I learned some weird fact, I'd like jump down after it and then, and then like I say, try to make it easier, you know, I mean it's a lot of work to find all this stuff, but you, you, you try to make it easier for people like you who are reading it. To, to have that kind of right, right at your fingertips. So I'm gonna, um, there's 27 trips in this book. And one of the other things I learned in this book is that's not nearly <coughs> enough. I go from Cape Charles up to Chestertown and over to Dover or Hobart. Um, so I learned while working on these first 27 that there needs to be another 20. Once I get to that 54, then I think I'll be making a dent in some of the trips that you can take here. Um, so as I realized that while writing this book, so there's a bunch of places that aren't, aren't in there, and they're not in there on purpose because I needed some of the big names in the second book. So, so there's no, there's a trip to the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum, but there's not one to St. Michael's. Oxford is not in there. Um, uh, Rehoboth, there's not a trip for Rehoboth. There's one for Ocean City. Uh, oh no, there is one for Rehoboth. There's not one for Lewis, that's it. So anyway, there's a lot of trips in there. So after I get done with the Taubman book, then, then I'll be trying to finish up the next um, 27. 
uh, road trips. Um, I think the biggest surprise I had since the book came out is um, how many people, I just wouldn't have predicted this, I don't make anything of it, uh, but uh, the number of people who have read the book and said, I really want to go to Cape Charles. I, just, I would never have picked that particular place as the one that more people than any other uh, would pick out. It's a very interesting story. I can't wait to go back. They've got a bunch of Sears houses that are still standing down there. That I'm e eager to take a tour of. Mm -hmm. um, but that was just a you know, little sidelight, a little surprise. And part, another part of the way this book took shape was because she was dragging me out here, there, and everywhere um, to shoot sunglasses. And she was uh, becoming a photographer during the course of these last however many years. Um, and so she wants to share a few things about how to look at the Eastern Shore and do trips. I'm just going to stay on this side <coughs> control the be in control here. But uh, yeah, it's true. I mean, this book project that Jim embarked on, it, it definitely changed my life, too. Because um, as you heard earlier, I actually started my career as a writer and then evolved into a graphic designer. And I always liked photography, but um, I had just started getting into it when he started, uh, you know, thinking about this book. So uh, it was through this process that it became an obsession for me. So, <laughs> uh, but it's a good obsession to have as things go. Um, but the, the the thing about photography that I've learned as I've um, learned more and gone out is that. I, I just see the world in new ways. You know, I'm constantly aware of the, the way the light is falling, whether inside or outside, the clouds, the potential for something dramatic, you know, like this uh, sunset of the Choptank River Lighthouse, which ended up becoming the cover photo uh, of the book. So, and I, I do like to try and capture some of that, that eastern shore beauty that know that we're used to seeing and maybe sometimes we take it for granted so whether it's a skipjack race in Cambridge uh, waterman on his morning commute or a moonrise also at the Chop Tank River Lighthouse I have a few thousands of photos of the lighthouse there um, but exploring the eastern shore with Jim has also helped me see beauty in unexpected places now this this photo has a little bit of a backstory that you don't see. It looks like a nice sunset. But um, this was the middle of winter. We were with some friends exploring. It was freezing. And everyone's huddled in the car. We go to this you know, downtrodden <coughs> campground. And there's just junk everywhere. Nobody's there. It's, it's just not a very attractive sight uh, in the daylight. And I get all excited, <laughs> and they're looking at me like, what, what, what do you see here? And, but I saw something you know, that they didn't see right away, and um, I created this photo, and they, when I shared it with them later, they, they were shocked. Um, so sometimes it's, it's just a matter of seeing things um, in, a, in, a, in a little bit different way. So, or you know, maybe it's the fog. You know, usually you see fog, you think, oh, can't go out and drive, you know, it's unsafe, it's inconvenient, it's <coughs> impressive. Um, when I see a foggy day, I run for the camera and, and head out the door. And to me, it's mystery and intrigue. Um, so I, I can't resist the fog. Uh, same thing goes with snow. So when, when most people are trying to stay inside the house, that's when I try to head outside. <laughs> and I also find beauty in patterns and shapes and things that are old and weathered and grungy and quirky things. And there's plenty of those here on the eastern shore. So this is right here in Easton, the Purdue silos on Kent Lane. Um, just, you know, fascinating shapes and lines there. <clears throat> um, and here, you know, a gaggle of rusty bicycles behind a bike shop. 
can't, can't resist trees that have succumbed to sea level rise and salt water. This is the remains of an old port. To get here at sunrise, we had to tromp through, again, a very uninviting place uh, and marshy muck, almost lost a shoe, and um, you know, not, not the kind of place you would think to take a sunrise stroll, but for me, it was, again, exciting and had all this potential. And so that's, that's what I like to do. Um, or, you know, places that you see every day. This is a tire shop in Cambridge. I had driven by it hundreds of times, and, but I never really stopped to actually look at it. And so one day I pulled into the parking lot for something else, that they share a parking lot, and suddenly caught my eye. Hey, that's, that's kind of interesting there. So, um, or, you know, abandoned houses. They're, they're just, they have a lot of intrigue too. You wonder about the stories there. And this is how I found this. <laughs> I did not set this up. This was just the way it was in this empty house. Uh, and the quirky. Um, <laughs> 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 above. I sure can't. <laughs> And for me, <laughs> the more awkward, the better. And what I mean by that is, while photography makes me more observant of what's around me and the details and such, it also challenges me to try to keep in physical shape. Uh, it's, you know, not only lugging around the camera equipment, although I do have a, a fine tripod carrier uh, right over there. <laughs> But it's the, the positions that you have to get into um, when trying to get the shot. So I don't have shots of me in those positions, but <laughs> I have products. You know, here I was down on my belly in the middle of the road. Um, this was on a very, very cold day uh, down by the waterfront. And it was so cold and windy, the water had sprayed up on the grass and had clumped on each tuft of grass and made these kind of alien looking things. And I just was so fascinated by it, I just had to end up on my belly, <laughs> on the ice, in the cold, just to get the, uh, the, the close up view. So, <clears throat> uh, and sometimes it means just laying on my back in the sand. This is with the horseshoe crabs in Delaware. Uh, where the shorebirds come and feast on the, their eggs during their migration. So I just was hunkered down, um, trying to be as unobtrusive as possible, um, and just, you know, just stay stock still there while the birds did their, their thing. <clears throat> uh, this required squeezing through a, a, a little opening in an abandoned silo and, and looking up. <laughs> And this, um, out in the snow again, uh, this, you can't see me, hopefully not, I'm behind the umbrella crouched down. <laughs> it was a very windy day and um, the umbrella kept blowing away and I was by myself. My tripod, trusty tripod carrier wasn't Too cold with for me. me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I had to set the camera on self timer and run get the umbrella in position and crouch down behind it to keep it from blowing away. And I'm glad that none of you were there to watch me run back and forth 50 times <laughs> trying to, to get the picture the way I wanted it to. <laughs> sometimes, uh, you know, the photography thing requires other kinds of skills like picking crab and making crab cakes and styling a shoot so I could Know, have fun with this whole Earth Day, Earth Day concept. Um, so, oh, in, in conclusion, <laughs> I am just very thankful uh, that Jim has, has worked on this book and has brought us to new adventures and in the way that both of us see the world. I mean, he sees the world, um, he sees the stories that aren't visible 
to us. He sees the past and in the mind's eye. And me, I only have to have, have what's there to work with and cap, try to capture it with, with my camera. But I think, you know, together we make a, a pretty good team and, and we're certainly having a lot of fun with it. So, thank you. Thank you. The book is Eastern Shore Road Trips, 27 One Day Adventures on Del Mar. Now what are you waiting for? Get off the couch and go, go, have fun. And don't forget, the library has lots of travel books. We'll see you